and welcome to our online service for this the fourth Sunday before Lent. In a moment Kate Denny is going to be giving us our reading for today uh, followed by which we're going to go to St James at eight o'clock this morning where I was preaching the sermon. Unfortunately, the camera ran out of battery uh, just literally a couple of minutes before the end of the sermon. Uh, so I've just re-recorded that ending. Uh, uh, so just be aware that at the end of the sermon, we'll, we'll switch back to the rectory for a couple of minutes to finish it off. Uh, then I will we'll be handing over to Jenny Jantz for our prayers of intercession today. Uh, and then as usual, finishing with a choir piece, which this week is the church's one foundation. So over to Kate for today's reading. The reading is taken from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15. Now I should remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn have received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to someone untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. Here ends the reading. When uh, I was in Dubai, uh, the Anglican Church there uh, did something which most of the other churches there didn't do. We allowed other denominations and congregations to use our building. Only 10 licensed churches in Dubai, uh, still are only 10, uh, and, uh, but there were hundreds, literally hundreds, of other um, congregations and denominations uh, throughout Dubai, uh, desperate for places to worship. And so because we, we had these buildings licensed and legally authorised for Christian worship, uh, but obviously we could only use them as a limited amount of time each week, we allowed other congregations to use them. Uh, my first church there, Holy Trinity Dubai, the old part of Dubai, we had over a hundred congregations, other churches from all around the world that would meet in those buildings during the week. Uh, and over the weekend and every evening, every hall, one of the 20 halls there was full. Uh, and then the, the church I moved down to, Christ Church, Jebelani, slightly similar church, we had 45, uh, 46, 47 by the time I left, congregations that used to worship there. And we weren't quite the only church that did that, uh, whereas the Catholics only had Catholics worship, worshiping in their building, the Copts only had Copts, the Greek Orthodox only had Greek Orthodox, uh, we shared our building. Actually, the Evangelical Church next to us did also share their building with a, with a small number of other church congregations, 14 or 15. Um, 
But to do that, to worship in the evangelical church, you have to sign up to the evangelical statement of faith. And it's on their website. I actually looked at it uh, this morning to just remind myself before I spoke to make sure I wasn't speaking out of turn. Uh, so they've got their statement of faith uh, on their website. And every, every other church that worshiped there had to sign up to that specific statement of faith. Now, most of it we would, we would probably have no trouble signing up to, and some of you may have had no trouble signing up to all of it. But there are a couple of things in there about their view of biblical interpretation, their view of um, salvation and who's actually going to heaven and where people who don't go to heaven are going, that actually I would struggle to sign up to. And for us, uh, in our church, in order to, for us to accept you to worship in our building, what you have to sign up to was the historic creeds. So not, nothing that we've written or specific to our church, but the historic creeds of the Christian faith, which actually all Christian churches should be able to sign up to. Now those historic creeds um, are effectively the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, those are the big two, those are the ones that you've probably heard of, those are the ones that we use in our worship. We use the Nicene Creed. Uh, every, every communion service, every use of Eucharistic service has the Nicene Creed in it, uh, and normally in a prayer book service, we say it before the sermon. Uh, common worship services, we say it after the sermon. And today we're going to be saying it after the sermon because my sermon is going to give you a little bit of context <laughs> about the creed. But when we say it, hopefully, uh, there'll be a bit more meaning to it today. Um, there are actually two other historic creeds. There's the, the Chalcedon Creed and the Athanasian Creed. Um, the Chalcedon Creed doesn't get used very often. It's very specific about the nature of Christ. Uh, the Athanasian Creed um, actually is in the prayer book, uh, and it said that there are certain specific days of the year when we're supposed to use the Athanasian Creed. Very few churches do, however, because it's, it's actually quite long. It's a lot longer than the Nicene Creed or the, uh, the Apostles' Creed. Uh, and it's, it's also uh, quite detailed and uh, a bit too specific in some places as well. So very rarely is the Athanasian Creed used, but it is, it is authorised. So when uh, in our Dubai, we were saying sign up to the historic Greeks. We were basically talking about the Apostles' Creed, and particularly um, the Nicene Creed, the one that we're going to be saying um, in a little while. The Apostles' Creed is generally thought to be um, the oldest, uh, although actually, whilst the phrases that make up the Apostles' Creed do date right back to the earliest days of Christianity, actually the Creed itself isn't found anywhere in its entirety uh, until the 5th or 6th century. So, so actually, in terms of the, the whole creed, as it's now said, um, actually, technically, the Nicene Creed is older. The Nicene Creed uh, dates from the 4th century uh, and was put together by the Council of Nicaea. So bishops and all the important people of the church of that day met in a place called Nicaea and agreed on the words of this creed. Except the creed we use today isn't quite the one. They met again at Constantinople in the year 380 something, uh, and they revised it and changed it a bit. Uh, and, uh, and that's actually the group that we use today. So, more strictly, it should be called the Nicene Constantinople group, but don't worry about that. In fact, for another point, uh, it was amended slightly uh, hundreds of years later. If you look, if you, if you open your creed there, Nicene creed. Um, if you find a bit about the Holy Ghost, uh, so halfway down to page 6, it says, And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son. Now the words and the Son were actually added in uh, hundreds of years later. Um, and um, was quite controversial. I'm not going to go into details of why they were added in or why it was controversial. Uh, it's known as the Philetque Clause, uh, and it actually became one of the things that the Eastern and Western Church fell out over. So the Orthodox Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, and the Western Catholic, what we would now call the Catholic Church, split uh, in the 12th century, and the Philetque Clause was one of the things that split them. There's a sermon uh, for another day there. <laughs> now, although these, these creeds that have become agreed and which we, which we say during our services, 
uh, have become recognised and authorised over hundreds of years. That's not to say that the earliest Christians didn't have uh, creeds and things that they would formally agree and say together uh, and would see as a, a statement of what it meant to be a Christian. There were things, and some of those things have been adopted later into, into, into later creeds and things. I've referred to the Apostles' Creed and how some of the statements that make that up are our early statements. There are other statements of faith that early Christians used to use, uh, some of them from the Old Testament. Uh, Paul's letter to Timothy uses several uh, Old Testament uh, statements which were clearly used as statements of faith by, by Christians. Um, but the earliest kind of formal, recognised and, and quite creedal statement um, is actually one found in our epistle reading today, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 5, which I read earlier. <coughs> Paul's, so Paul says to the Corinthians, you know, this is the faith which we have received. So this is, this is something that he was given. He said, I, I was given this, I, I received this uh, from, from those who were Christians before me. Now, Paul, remember, became a Christian some three or four years after Christ's crucifixion, the road to Damascus experience, etc. Um, so, uh, Historically, we, we think this statement that he then quotes actually comes from those very first few years after Christ's death. So it would be one of the very first um, creedal statements used. Um, so Paul says, For I handed on to you, as of first importance, what I in turn had received, that, and here, and here we go with the creed of it, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So that phrase probably sounds, hopefully sounds familiar to you, because actually part of it has been adopted into the Nicene Creed. So on the page five and top of page six, he suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures. So that's straight out of uh, that, that Creed, which goes right back to the very early days of Christianity. Now Paul is specifically emphasising this bit of creed here because he is emphasising to the Corinthians the importance of resurrection. If you go on to read chapter 15, you will see that most of the chapter is Paul basically telling the Corinthians that some of them have questioned the, the resurrection and whether it really happened. And so in, in chapter 15 of Corinthians, Paul is particularly arguing, look, you can't, this isn't something that's, uh, that's negotiable. Uh, the, the resurrection is, is a key fundamental building block in our faith. If you take, if you take that out, actually uh, the structure of our faith comes tumbling down. The resurrection is, is absolutely key. Uh, and so in chapter 15 he's arguing why uh, it's key and also why it's, it's self-evident why it's believed by Christians. And also, he has the, <laughs> he has the, the enviable position, which we don't have today, of saying, because actually, there's loads of people still alive, and he names several of them, who actually saw Jesus after he rose from the dead. So you know, he's, he's, got, he's got quite a good uh, piece of argument there that we don't have any today, today, because clearly all those people have gone. But at the time, he was making it clear to the Corinthians, look, not only is this important to our faith and, and what we believe, not, not only is there lots of evidence, but actually there are people still alive who saw it, hundreds of them. Uh, uh, and he goes on to make this argument throughout. Now, uh, so, so Paul, in, in that bit of creed that's been adopted into the Nicene Creed, um, is, is focusing in on a particular element of our faith and emphasising why it's important. And actually, Quite, quite a lot of bits of our creeds uh, come from that kind of history. Moments of argument and tension where, where people said, well, hang on, let's actually write this down. Let's all agree together what it is that we believe about this so that we can, so, so that we can all say, no, 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 this, this is what the church believes and understands. Um, to, essentially to create unity, to, to bring the different elements of the church together. So, for example, when the Nicene Creed uh, was written, um, the divinity of Christ was, was, was actually a, 
an, an issue. It was being argued about. <coughs> it was a group of people called the Arians, the Arian controversy. Uh, and they were denying that Christ was literally God. Um, so that's why, uh, if you look at the Apostles' Creed, whilst it kind of states the basics, the Nicene Creed goes into much more detail about the nature of Jesus. And uh, so, firstly, the Father Almighty, and it says, The Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of the substance of the Father. So, you can see there's a, there's a lot of detail there, and again, we won't go into all of that today, but that, that's basically, they're using words to make it absolutely clear. Jesus is divine. Jesus is God in human form. Jesus was uh, begotten of the Father, not made. Jesus isn't a created thing. Jesus, like God, uniquely, uh, actually, uh, is before time and outside of creation. So, so, so the, the creeds emphasise these absolutely key elements of our faith. Uh, and in those early councils at Nicaea and Constantinople, which I see them later on, um, they, were, they were created by the church, coming together and saying, these are the things which unify us, these are the things which unite us. Now over time, the creeds, particularly the Nicene Creed, um, the key time that it was used was at baptism. So when somebody was baptised into the Christian faith, they would have to learn this and they would have to recite it at their baptism. And baptisms uh, traditionally took place on Easter Day. So during Lent, the 40 days of Lent, people would be prepared, the catechumens would be prepared for baptism, they would be baptised on Easter day, and they would recite this creed together to say, yes, I am now a Christian, I have been baptised into the Christian faith, and these, the, these are the things that I believe because I am now a Christian. So uh, it was welcoming people into the faith, and again, saying that these newly baptised Christians, they are now one with us, they are part of the Christian family, they are part of the body of Christ. Um, and one of the reasons that we still say these creeds today in our services, Apostles' Creed in non-Eucharistic services, Nicene Creed in Eucharistic services, um, is, is, is for similar purposes, to remind us of our own baptism, to remind us what it is that we believe, the fundamentals of our faith, the things that unite us. I talked about um, the evangelical church next door to us uh, in Dubai uh, and how for them to allow, to recognise churches to worship in their building, they had to sign up to all the detail of what they believed. What we felt as Anglicans though was that we, we wanted to welcome Christians, other brothers and sisters from the Christian church, the body of Christ throughout the world. We knew that we would disagree with them about some things, their view of biblical interpretation, their view of salvation, their ideas about women, priests, or homosexuality. We knew we'd disagree about those things, but we knew that as long as we agreed on these things, that we were brothers and sisters in Christ, that we were part of the worldwide church and the body of Christ, that we had that unity with them, even though we might disagree about what I would say is some of the detail, although some of that detail is very important, um, we've, with the fundamentals of the, the creeds. And so these creeds were accepted by every, every branch of the church and, and still broadly are today. And this very day in Dubai, um, my old churches and the hundreds of congregations that worship in them will be saying these very words together, not necessarily in English in all kinds of other languages, uh, and, and, and indeed around the world, millions of Christians today will be saying these words as they break bread um, together. So as we say them in a little while um, after uh, I finish talking, <laughs> um, it's a sign of unity, not just amongst ourselves, simply, simply reciting them together uh, is a way of recognising that we are members of this church. But it also should remind us that around the world, Catholics, Protestants, Lutherans, Anglicans are all saying these same words this very day, and that we are united with them as brothers and sisters in Christ. Of course, it's not just 
to the act uh, of unity, the words themselves are important. Uh, and um, it's so easy because we say them week in, week out, to just take them for granted and not even think about them. Even as I was preparing this sermon, actually, I, I came across something which I actually never really thought about before. Um, and it's actually from our 1 Corinthians, uh, and it's the bit that comes in there from Paul, uh, which is on the third day he wrote again, our uh, final the resurrection, um, according to the scriptures. Every time we say we say according to the scriptures. And actually, I hadn't really thought before that that's one of the most unusual places to put the phrase according to the scriptures, because there's lots of other stuff here that I could give you quite clear biblical verses, Old Testament biblical verses. Remember, when Paul wrote according to the scriptures, he was talking about the Hebrew Bible, he was talking about what we would call the Old Testament, the Gospel. Mark's Gospel might have been written. Uh, Paul wrote that letter in about 55 AD. Mark's Gospel might have been written by that time. Uh, we're not entirely sure, it was written around about that time. But he certainly, there, was no, there were no Christian scriptures at that time, really. So he was looking at Old Testament scriptures. Now, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I would give you loads of Old Testament scriptures that back that up, etc., um, etc. Et but even the Holy Spirit is referred to in the Old Testament. But Christ's death and resurrection, actually, it's quite hard to find specific biblical verses in the Old Testament that support the death and resurrection of the Messiah. Now, some people would say that it's the it's the on the third day bit that comes from according to the scriptures. There's um, Jonah uh, in the belly of the whale, there's stuff in some of the minor prophets that, that talk about three days and uh, rising and regeneration after three days, etc. Um, so, so some people will say it's the three day thing. Actually, it, it's probably a bit broader than that. Um, the key texts, scriptural texts, um, both for Jews, but actually particularly for Christians in those early days, was the Psalms. Uh, and the Psalms were really important to early Christians because they saw so much in there which spoke about the coming Messiah, etc., etc. But the Psalms also talk quite a lot uh, about death and resurrection, about Sheol, about God being with me beyond death, etc. So um, it's generally thought that when Paul says, according to the scriptures. It's actually the Psalms that he's, he's talking about that. Do you know, I didn't know that before <laughs> this week. Uh, I only found that out while I was looking at this sermon. So, so you may, if you actually, when you got home, uh, dug out your prayer book or whatever else, or went online and looked at the Nicene Creed, there may be things there that you've, you've been saying week after week, but have never really uh, kind of thought about in the depth that I've just found out about according to the scriptures. There may be other stuff there. So in terms of like your individual faith, it's certainly worth uh, having a look at this creed and thinking about what it means. You, you said it. You say it most weeks. Um, you, you start by saying, I believe. I believe in, etc., etc. And I believe. And I believe. Well, do you? And what is it that you're actually saying each week that you believe? So, um, it, from an individual point of view, I think it's worth looking at, uh, as well as the kind of communal and unifying aspect of the creeds as well. Um, two final things to finish off. Firstly, simply believing these things doesn't make you a Christian. <laughs> Famous quote, the devil believes all this stuff. The devil believes that there is one God. The devil believes that God created the world. The devil believes that Jesus is God in human form. That doesn't make the devil a Christian. Okay? So simply believing it isn't, isn't enough. Two things. Firstly, you have to live it out. You have to act it out. Uh, we can all intellectually sign up to all this stuff, hopefully. Uh, but, that, but being a Christian is so much more than just what you believe. It's actually how you live your life. It's acting it out. Conversely, simply living as a Christian doesn't make you a Christian either. There are lots of people, non-Christians, people of other faiths, atheists, who live really good lives and probably do better than many of us at living out Christian principles and living in a Christian way. So equally, simply doing that doesn't make you a Christian either. The word 
creed comes from credo, the Latin word for I believe. So in Latin, this starts with credo. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. But actually, if you go even further back into the meaning of the word credo, it actually, it actually means in my heart. Credo means in my heart. So to, to believe in Latin means actually to take something into your heart, not into your brain. And so this deeper meaning and understanding of the word credo tells us what it is to truly believe. To truly believe means not just to mentally assent to something, to agree that it's true. Um, it means allowing it to dwell in our hearts, to become part of who we are. And so when we say the creed together, yes, we're affirming the facts of our faith. Yes, we're asserting our unity with those who believe the same as us. Yes, to a degree, we're rejoicing uh, in the wonderful truths of our faith. But we're also saying this is who we are. This is who we are as a church. This is who we are as individuals because these are the things we truly believe. These are the things which dwell in our hearts. Amen. Now after the services at both 8 and 10 this morning, uh, we stood and we said the Nicene Creed together. And um, I'd like us to do that now. Uh, the words are going to appear on the screen uh, and I'd like you to, uh, sitting if you like, <laughs> say them along with me. So here are the words. And so let us affirm our faith by saying together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And so now we go to Jenny for our prayers of intercession and then on to the choir. Today we're thinking about shared faith and the words of the Creed. We pray to the Trinity, to Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, to Jesus Christ, our Lord, and to the Holy Spirit, breath of love, of life, God's power in action. We thank you and praise you for your patience and love for us for being there even when we falter and stumble in our faith, for your gifts to us, for when we feel you moving and working through us, we open our hearts to you. Let us pray with Christians all around the world for that most important shared action of faith, to love our neighbour. Let our prayer and deeds be a ripple of love and light from neighbour to neighbour, across this often angry, tense, unhappy world. For nations to support other nations, for people of other faiths and creeds and opinions 
to respect and care for each other and for our planet. May this love and fellowship help decisions to alleviate the terrible suffering of the people of Afghanistan, of Syria, Palestine, Yemen, and to protect the people of Ukraine and give wisdom and compassion to the decisions of our world leaders. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, our Lord, Holy Spirit, be with us today and always. Guide us, work through us. We bring the plight of the homeless to you, to the increasing numbers of homeless people on the streets of our cities and to the hidden homeless in Surrey. We pray for those people who have defaulted on payments and been turned out of their homes, who are not a council priority because they don't have children, who are sleeping in cars and vans or sofa surfing, who are the unseen, desperate and vulnerable. In particular, we pray for Jess, who has been missing for nearly two weeks. Lord Jesus, wrap her in your arms and protect her. Bring her to safety. We pray for help and support for all those who are already struggling financially and living with the anxiety of hardship, who do not have the resources to cope with the rising tide of inflation the potential homeless. In this country of such wealth, we pray for a fairer society and a safety net for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, our Lord, Holy Spirit, be with us. Guide us to hear your voice and to do your works. We pray for the hospital doctors, nurses and ambulance crews who are overstretched and exhausted because of short staffing levels. For the inexperienced staff who are being given tasks which are too difficult. For the experienced staff who are exhausted through being unable to share their caseload. Father God, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, be with all these amazing people who care so much for others. We pray for people who are anxiously struggling to access medical services, who are waiting for appointments and operations. May they have courage and resilience and may their turn come soon. We bring before you all those people who are sick or struggling. We name in our hearts those known to us who need your help. Our Lord and Comforter, be with them. We pray for the lives of Mariel Hunt and Celia Stonehill. May you keep them in your eternal protection and love and wrap your comfort around their families and friends and all those who mourn. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lastly, on the 70th anniversary of her accession, we pray for Elizabeth, our Queen. We thank you, Lord, and give praise for her remarkable long reign, for her unswerving deeply interested, caring and loyal service to the peoples of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. <laughs> 